I heard one preacher put it this way one time. He says, as he gets up to preach, I'm just anxious to find out what I'm going to say. <laughs> and in some way, <laughs> in, in some way he is correct because I can tell you after 55 some years, after 55 plus years of ministry, week after week, message after message, sermon after sermon, I had so often planned on saying certain things and bringing out certain things only for God to dispose what I had proposed. And not that it wouldn't have been good, it would have been good what I shared, but the the, the word of the hour is what's most important to the Lord. Is that right? That's right. It's what God is saying now, this moment of time. And sometimes that varies. And today, I want to share with you what's on my heart concerning the continuing of the following of the Lamb of God. Following the Lamb. The children of God during the tribulation had one clue that they should have adhered to before the tribulation. <laughs> if you'd have followed the Lamb before tribulation came, you wouldn't be in a tribulation. Yeah, that's right. right. Amen. <clears throat> the fact that you're in the tribulation is that you were following something else. Yeah. Following somebody else following some other ideology, some other philosophy, some idol, some form of religion, Christianity, but denying the power of God, living in disobedience and in rebellion. And God was on the very lower end of the ladder, you know, the rung of the ladder, rather than being top shelf in your life. What happens is that when we put God that far out of reach, on the very perimeters of our whole life is that God said, if you want it your way, you can have it your way, but there's a price to pay. We can tell our kids the same thing. You know, we try to warn our kids. We try to admonish them. We try to advise them. As Edward G. Robinson would say, do it my way, kid. You'll like it. And so we try to tell our kids that our children, if you just adhere to my instruction, instruction again, you are not going to fall in a ditch. You're not going to fall in a pit or a snare in your life. But they have their own ideas. They want to do their own thing. So, and we know what the consequences are there. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I made a mistake. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how that happened. I wonder why that did. Huh? So what happens when the church is lifted out from the earth, the wrath of God then will be unleashed for a time. Is that right? right? It's called tribulation. The wrath of God will be unleashed. The tribulation that people go through now in the world and have been for the last 2,000 years are a sample of what the tribulation is going to be like. But it's not the great tribulation. It's a different between tribulation and the great tribulation. In the first 300 years of the church, first 300 years of the church. The church went through persecution starting with Nero all the way to Diocletian up to the 3rd century, uh, AD 300. And Diocletian, just prior to Constantine coming in as emperor of Rome, the church went through Nero to Diocletian and these two were the very, very worst. I mean, Satan threw his best at the church to destroy the existence of the church. People were martyred during that period of time. The church for the first 300 years was 300 years of tribulation. But it's not the great tribulation. Diocletian went after three or four things. He said, I want to get all their literature, whatever literature that I can find, whatever literature you can put your hands on, destroy it, burn it. Next thing we're going to get is their places of worship. If they worship in a house, that house is going to be burned down. If they worship somewhere else in a barn somewhere, that will be burned down. Destroy their places of worship. Thirdly, destroy the preachers. And he was on a quest to destroy those three things more than anything else. Well, that didn't work. 
for the first 300 years. All that they did to try to destroy God's activity in the earth did not work. That was tribulation times. And over the centuries and millennia following that, there have been periods of great massacres of Christians to this day. There aren't many. All that to say this. There has been tribulation. As Jesus already forewarned us, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Now, when it comes to the great tribulation, it will grow in frequency and intensity as never seen on the face of the earth. Not only will those who will trust the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation during that period of time when they've seen everything, all the people gone all of a sudden, they know they've missed the rapture, but even the earth itself, think about this, the earth itself will feel the wrath of God. There's going to be, this earth is going to have earthquake like it's never had. It's going to have floods like it's never had. It's going to have volcanoes like it's never had. Eruptions. It's going to have hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, lightning bolts. The earth itself will feel the agony and the wrath of God. Not just the people on it. So the Great Tribulation is not a place where you want to be. How many would prefer to make the rapture? Amen. I encourage you to get this table right if you want that table All right. to make that rapture, to have the marriage feast. But because of difference, and that's what's called. Everybody say, I'm saved. I'm saved. My question is, from what? Isn't that the common question? Isn't that, should that not be this follow, logical follow-up? I'm saved, but from what? Saved from the wrath of God. Paul speaks about it in the first, first Thessalonians. We're saved from the wrath of God that is yet to come. That's what we're saved from. So if we want to make the rapture, it, your, 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 your prize is right. The mark is right. And that is to see the Lord Jesus in all of his glory. Here's the point. There is that period of time for seven years, three and a half of those years are going to be absolutely horrendous. Because after a period of time, the two witnesses are going to be removed from the earth. That's when it really breaks loose. Now, here's the point I want to make to you now. Those who didn't make the rapture realize what they missed. They will fully comprehend what they have really, really missed. They're going to have to pay a price to maintain their allegiance to the Lord and their devotion even unto death. Listen closely what I have to tell you today. The question that is asked in verse, uh, is it 14 or 13? Verse 13 or 14 of Revelation chapter 7. I'm sorry I didn't get to 2 Corinthians. Go back again. I'll get there in just a second. Uh, the elders ask me, who are these arrayed and what? Uh, who are these people in verse 2? Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where do they come from? And then verse 14. <coughs> Sir, you know, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And in other places in the scriptures of Revelation, it shows us that the numbers, Pastor Stephan, were so great, almost when you cannot count them, in fact, so, that they're like the sands of the ocean. That he was saying it's impossible. Now, let me tell you something. If you can succeed, if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation years can make it and make it well, not just by the skin of their teeth, but make it completely victoriously, 
then if we're on this side of the tribulation, we have no excuse. Because we will never see what they will be seeing at that time. We're inexcusable in terms of our lethargy, in terms of our apathy, in terms of our chilling walk with God, in terms of neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. There's no, I mean, it's just a tremendous, tremendous, we, we, we're just, I'd hate to see anybody from this church or anybody viewing by our YouTube today or listening by CD, I'd hate to see anyone my beloved friends, brothers and sisters of the Lord, go through tribulation. But I often think to myself, if you can't make it during the easy times, what in the world do you think you're going to make it during the hard times? Yeah. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got to catch me out out here for crying out loud. If a headache, if a, if a headache puts your spiritual pinball machine on tilt and you can't function anymore because you have a headache, Then and then I say there's something wrong in your relationship with Christ. So here's the point that's going to be really emphasized here today. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood, verse 15. The blood of the Lamb. There's the Lamb again. Remember the theme of these series of messages, they follow the Lamb. The first place you go to when it comes to the Lamb is to His blood. That is to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ where He shed His blood. You come to the table where it represents His blood. Everything that is, is relative to the blood of Jesus Christ, your first point of victory is the cross of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Your first point of victory is your deliverance from the powers of sin in your life and the powers that overwhelm your own person that dominate your will. They went to the blood of the Lamb. When they get through the blood of the Lamb, they are there before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in the temple. And He who sits on the throne, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 16, <coughs> dwell among them. How, but isn't that what we're supposed to be experiencing now? Yes, amen. Yes. Amen. What? Isn't this the church age? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't this a description of what the church age should be? They're washing the blood. They're forever before the throne of God, worshiping, serving God day and night. This, listen, we need to learn. Oh, let, let, let us uh, do some time travel this morning, shall we? <laughs> Let's move forward to the tribulation times. Let's learn something from them. You and I must live always within the context of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Day and night before the throne of God, worshiping Him, glorifying Him, serving Him, day and night under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping Amen. Him. Amen. It starts now. Let's learn as we travel in space-time. Let's learn from our good brothers and sisters later on in the tribulation how they made it. They followed the Lamb. Are we following the Lamb? As, am I, as an individual, following the Lamb? Thank you. Even if the following of the Lamb leads you to the cross. Right. Even if the following of the Lamb leads you to self-denial. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to serve me. If you serve me, you're going to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me every single day. Pastor, you're depressing me. Give me something to lift me up here. <laughs> it is. Right. <laughs> yes. How many know that instruction in righteousness will lift you up? Yes. Yes. If, if you want just an emotional quick shot, you're at the wrong church. Right. But if you want to be put on your feet to stand tall and stand strong front and center, then you're at the right place. Amen. <laughs> We're not raising patsies here. We're not raising people who live in a fluff cloud of cotton candy. 
Make me feel good, Pastor. Say something make me feel good about myself, Pastor. I want I, listen. I want you to feel good about Jesus, not you. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to lay condemnation on anybody's feet. But if you feel good about Jesus, Jesus will make sure you feel good about yourself. Amen. Amen. You'll feel better about yourself once Jesus is on the throne. Notice that these were worshiping God and serving Him before His throne day and night. That means we've got to learn the role expectation. Who's on the throne and who's off the throne. I am not on the throne of my heart. I'm not. I can't. I can't afford to be on the throne of my life. That's right. Jesus must be on the throne of my heart where I worship Him within my heart. He must be on the throne of my life, my anticipation, my expectation, my desires, my will, my purpose. He must be on the throne of my future. They, were, they washed their robes. You know that robe thing is very important for us to see here. They washed their robes. They washed their robes in the blood. What is the robe? What is the robe? It, it, can we talk? As Phyllis and Dover, can we talk? Let's talk. The robe. They wash their robes. Uh, Brother Leo, get you, get sharpen your pencil. You want to write this down. What is the robe that they wash? What is that robe? The robe that each of us got when we accepted Christ as our personal Savior. The one that says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things that they come through, that's, comes through. that's the robe. Is your new man. The robe is the identification of sanctification and glorification that comes from Christ. The robe is an identifier for you and God. Between you and heaven, between you and that which is eternal, that which is natural and temporal. The robe is what identifies identification. If you identify your faith in Jesus Christ, then your faith must remain in the blood. Yes. If your convictions are in the scriptures, then, then your convictions must be soaked in the blood on a daily basis. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The robe is righteousness. And the, the one of the ways, of course, is not just through the cleansing of our, of our hearts from sin, but also being proactive in Christian works. Proactive. Because the Bible says that in Revelation, as a matter of fact, that the white robes represented the good works that they did in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So in other words, their Christianity, watch now, their Christianity, their faith in Christ, their Christianity is the robe that needed to stay in the blood. How many know there are Christians rolling over on the holy days? That's what they call a holy roller. Christians who roll over on a holy day. They're holy rollers. They have Christianity without the Christ of Christianity. They, they, did you know that 90% of Americans believe in God? 90% believe in God. Not his percent plus. But believing in God, is that enough? Satan believes Amen. in the in other words, our religion, personal walk with God, must be drenched in the blood of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Their conscience must be cleansed. For if our heart condemns us not, then we have faith in God. And so, they, they have the, their robes Cleansed white, made white through the blood of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they worship God before the throne of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, day and night. They worship and they serve day and night. That's the tribulation saints. Let, let's, 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 stay, let's stay in the space travel mode for a moment. Let's just say that we're in the great tribulation right now. 
then I would have to preach to you and say, make sure that your conscience is clear before God. Amen. I'd have to tell you that. Amen. Secondly, I'd have to exhort you and admonish you, stay in a mode of worship day and night before God. Amen. Stay in a mode of praise and stay in an attitude of willingness to serve God. Amen. To serve the Lord. Let's stay in there for a moment in that space travel, time travel, right? And I would tell you this. Stay in the blood. That's why we have communion every Sunday. Stay in the blood. Secondly, worship God at the throne. Don't stop praising and worshiping Amen. God. Don't stop. Thirdly, keep serving God. Make Him first. In all of your activities. Yes. Pray about things that you plan in your life. Right. Don't take for granted because your feelings are moving you to it. No. Always, always, always pray. Yes. To know the purpose of God for your choices. Serve the Lord with gladness to my perception. And the result or equation to that, going back again to space time, space travel is that when these things occur, which they should have been occurring long before tri tribulation, but if they're occurring in tribulation, if it can work there, it can work now. So if, if this is what's happening then, the promise is, first of all, is that Jesus dwells among them. Yes. Now if that doesn't excite your exciter ability, your exciter ability is broken! When Jesus is in the midst, something should stir up it. If it doesn't, check your pulse, man. Amen. Yeah. It was important for the fourth thing is to recognize the actual presence of Christ with him. That the Lamb of God was in their midst. Do you see Jesus here? Do you recognize Jesus in our midst? If you, if you better do it now because the tribulation can make you want to be there. You've got to recognize it now. This is not Walt Disney's fantasy world. This is real. And I don't need special effects to make me feel Jesus. I don't need smoke, steam coming up to make me feel Jesus. What made these tribulation saints feel Jesus was the blood. Yes. It was persecution. Right. It was not a fantasy world, not a made up. You know too many churches and pastors and preachers and congregations, young people, I mean, you call it call it what you want. Listen close to me. If I have to fabricate something yep. to incite my sense of Christ among us, then there's something wrong with that picture. Right. Right. I don't need smoke on the platform. I don't need special lighting effects. I've been in some churches in Montreal, the church in Montreal, Trinity uh, Church in Montreal. When all the lights go dim, you can't even read your Bible. And all the spotlights, and then there, there's two big, huge pillars of special red, yellow, blue lights and stuff on either side, big huge pillars of lights on either side. Uh, are you saying that Jesus needs these things to help me feel him? I need lights to feel Jesus? Are you kidding me? Who do you think you're talking to here? You're insulting the very Christ that we pretend to worship. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You're insulting the very God that we're supposed to love. That's right. We love Him because of who He is. Right. Amen. The Son of God, my Redeemer who paid my, the price that I was supposed to pay. I love Him for who He is and what He's done for me. And I serve Him because it's my reasonable service, Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Yeah. It's my reasonable service. And so Jesus was in their midst. They recognized Jesus. 
Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Guess what? It's not to the sinner's heart that he's knocking. He's knocking on the Christian church door. And you Christians in there that claim to have me. Hello? Anybody in there? Yeah, you church members. Yeah, you Christians. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah you hear me. Do you hear my knock? Do you hear my voice? See, they had all of the artifacts. They had all of the particulars to look like a duck, walk like a duck, sound like a duck, smell like a duck. Except at this point, they're not a duck. Because everything is prefabricated synthetically, pretentiously. And Jesus said, if you'll hear my voice, I will open the door. I will come in and suck with you and you with me. So, it, 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 you know, the moment you have to fabricate something to make up something to incite the presence of Christ, you're already on thin ice. Jesus will not substitute his person nor his glory for anything or anybody else. When it comes to Jesus, it has to be the real thing or forget about it. So he dwells among them. And I want to emphasize this this morning, uh, Brother Charlie. He dwells among us. Do you believe that Jesus dwells among us here at Calvary? Amen. Would you raise your hand and declare that Jesus dwells Amen. here? Amen. That Jesus Amen. dwells in the midst of Calvary Community Church and in my home. Amen. Hallelujah. We make that confession of faith. We make that confession and profession of conviction that he dwells among us. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. He said the Bible said here that he will guide them and shepherd them. They shall neither hunger nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor heat. For the Lamb who is in, verse, uh, next verse, the Lamb who is in their midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to what? Living. 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 Yeah. And God will wipe away all the tears. The tears that he's wiping away, the tears of regret for not having this when they had the chance to have it back before the tribulation. Tears of regret. For instance, up until the time that Diane and I were traveling here to the church, we were getting texts from a, a person saying, I'm getting ready and won't be in church this morning. I won't let Satan bother me. I'm going to be there in church this morning. How many know that hell is full of people who have good intentions? Yes, right. yes. Right. yes it is. Well, I intended to go, but you know how things can get. Good intentions never achieve anything. That's right. Good intentions never achieve anything. He's going to wipe away tears of regret. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's try that. Verse 13. Let's try that. <laughs> now I'm into my message. You know, when you, Pastor Stephen, you read the scriptures sometimes. And, and there's a reason why that God puts these scriptures that I ask for the pre-message and pre-communion. Because I know that God wants some elaboration on the issues. Did anybody learn anything from the last 20 minutes that I've been sharing with you? Amen. Amen. Okay. That was from the pre-message scripture that Pastor Stephen read and we all read. Now as I get into the message this morning, hopefully I'll be able to get through that in the next 15 minutes. The Lord have mercy. My life depends on that to happen. We have a treasure in this earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now stop there just for a second. The first song we did this morning, look what the Lord has done. You see what I told you? What did I say about someone? If I need special lighting, if I need smoke off the platform, dim lights, if I need whatever eardrum blasting levels of sound, all of these things to incite the presence of the Lord, then you're saying the power is of you and not of God. That's right. 
Here he said that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. What if you never had another light bulb to put on? What if you never had another guitar or a piano or, or a violin to play or a trumpet? What if you had never another instrument to play? And all you had was your vocal cords. If all you had was your hands and vocal cords, could you worship and feel Jesus? Yeah. You should. No, you couldn't. <laughs> No, you couldn't. You mean with no special effects, no special, you can actually feel Jesus? Amen. Oh, now y'all just kidding me. You can actually feel Jesus. And you can actually worship Him in spirit and in truth without all of these special effects. Wow. Well, well, let me be the first to congratulate you. The right answer is yours. The power, the excellence of the power, the excellence of the power must be of God and not of us. What God's doing in your life is, is because of God. And you've made yourself available to God. And the excellent, the power of God within the congregation is excellent. And anything other than that is not excellent. Now, let's look at verse 8. It's going, uh, no, the next, what was that? Verse 8, yeah. Now, let's talk about tribulation, okay? We're talking about, now, watch, if this isn't tribulation, what Paul's going through, then I don't know what the word means, okay? We are hard-pressed on every side. Does that sound like tribulation? Amen. Does that, does, does that sound like your wife's on your, on your case? Right? I mean, does that sound like... <laughs> Does that sound like your husband the meathead lately? Does that sound like your kids are about to drive you crazy? Does it sound like you've, you've run out of, you've had more month left after the money than, than money after the month, all right? So when the bills are pressing everywhere, getting phone calls, blah, blah, blah. He said, we're hard pressed on every side. If that's not an expression of tribulation, I don't know what it is. When you're in the pressure cooker, when you're in the crucible, Right? You must know that just because that is happening, you're not going to be crushed. Somebody help me this morning. Somebody shout praise the Lord. You may have everything going against you right this moment, but if you're washed in the blood and you're worshiping Him at the throne day and night and serving Him and glorifying God in your life and you're serving the Lord with all your good works, though you may be hard pressed, you'll never be crushed like a roach underfoot. Because God's with you. Yes. We are perplexed. You know what perplexes? Perplexed means you're in a state of confusion, man. I didn't see that coming. I, my God, that thing just hit me upside the head. I didn't see it. <laughs> no. <laughs> hit upside the head. I love your brother Henry as a guest. See what I mean? But anyway. Amen. <laughs> that, that incident of life that even has lingering effects on me. But we're not in despair. Amen. I, I, Pastor Stephan, I can see tribulation 